A few weeks ago, Canon made a development announcement for the EOS R5, and it sounded amazing. They were bragging about this futuristic camera that would have full 8K among many other features. And honestly, nobody in the photography community completely believed it because Canon is kind of the boy who cried wolf. We've been hurt before. Today they announced that yes, indeed it is real. We're gonna talk about that, but also what it means for Sony, Nikon, and especially Panasonic, who could be really hurt by this development. But first, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. No matter what type of website you need, Squarespace makes it quick, easy, and beautiful. Especially if you're a photographer, you probably need several different Squarespace websites. I have three. Your corporate customers don't wanna see people kissing, and your wedding customers don't wanna see a row of 45 corporate headshots, right? Set up multiple Squarespace websites for each of your different personalities and the different sides of your business. If you wanna check out Squarespace, head to squarespace.com Tony. That'll get you a 14 day free trial. Use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. First, I want to announce the winner of My Parrot Anafi. It is Liam Mapp in Liverpool, England. Congratulations, Liam. Be sure to subscribe to see our next giveaway. If you haven't been keeping up on the EOS R5 news, here are the specs. The rumor is that it will have 45 megapixels, but we're not sure. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Canon clarified that the AK30 is real and that there's no crop factor for it. That's amazing and really, really difficult. They're also offering 120 frames per second at 4K, so you can do a significant slow motion capability. They are talking about in-camera stabilization, and the language around that is increasingly confusing. We'll talk about that. It will have two card slots, and the rumors, like Canon rumors, is suggesting that it's going to be a CF Express and an SD card. Canon initially said we should expect it in July of 2020, but now the rumors are that things are going to be delayed, and honestly, given the situation in China, where many parts are sourced, as well as the situation in Japan, where many employees are forced to work from home, I would be absolutely shocked if anything at all was delivered on time. Canon also added that this is going to have animal IAF and that it would be capable of recognizing dogs, cats, and birds. And that bird's point is really important to wildlife photographers like myself. If this is true and I could slap a 600 millimeter F4 on there and it would automatically pick out the eye on a flying bird, that would mean all those shots where it focuses on the wingtip and the body isn't quite sharp would be so much better. That would be a huge improvement but I'll have to try it to actually believe it because nobody's done that so far and it would be an immense computational task to do that. Let's talk about Canon's version of IBIS. Canon has never had sensor stabilization in any of their cameras, but all the recent cameras have had some sort of digital stabilization for the video. With the digital stabilization for each frame, the camera can sense the amount of camera movement, and then it basically crops the frame a little bit differently so that the pixels line up. It's exactly like adding in stabilization in post. Here's what's interesting about today's Canon press release. They phrase it as, it'll include a new approach to in-body image stabilization. My guess is they're putting in the words new approach because it is not sensor stabilization as we've come to know it from literally every other camera manufacturer. Here's my theory. They're going to use a system like the Google Pixel where pictures are rapidly captured with a very short shutter speed using the electronic shutter. Then they will align the images digitally using cropping and stack them together. This works with great effect in many different smartphones and there's no reason that it couldn't work in a high-end camera. I don't know why Canon isn't just giving us sensor stabilization. I mean, maybe they are, but the fact that they included the word a new approach to in-body image stabilization gives me some clue that they want us to know that it's not what we're accustomed to. Either way, I'm really excited to see it. Canon clarified that the AK30 is real, we had speculated, okay, it's going to be 8K, but it's going to be a time lapse, or it's going to be 8K only at 15 frames per second. GoPro did something like that to us once, or it's going to be 8K with no autofocus. The 8K, full 30 frames per second, no crop, unlike the EOS R with 4K, and full dual pixel 
autofocus. The first thing my mind did was ask, okay, well, what is wrong with it? Because every time Canon makes an announcement like this, I end up being disappointed. Here's the thing about offering full width video. Very few cameras have a sensor that perfectly matches the width of the video they output, and cameras use different techniques to read the full width of the sensor. The best is the technique that Sony uses on their latest cameras, where it reads every single pixel, basically a 6K worth of data and then squeezes it down to 4k that gives you a little bit of extra color information a little bit of extra detail with absolute no compromises but it takes a ton of processing power and that's indeed why sony developed its reputation for overheating Another technique is basically line skipping or pixel binning, where you're not reading the full output from every single individual pixel, you're reading enough and you're skipping some. And this produces basically more noise because you're not gathering the full surface area and a little bit less sharpness, but it does allow you to record video without cropping. My D850 did that when I recorded 4K in full width. The third option is that the sensor width actually matches the width of the video output. The Sony A7S series of cameras do this for 4K. That's why they have only a 12 megapixel sensor. That's unusually low, but they wanted to match the width of full 4K, so they didn't have to use any tricks when doing full width output. Which of those is the Canon going to be doing? I will be shocked if they are oversampling and reading something greater than 8K and then squeezing it down into 8K30. That would just take a monumentous amount of processing power. My hunch right now is that they are going to be offering a 39 megapixel sensor that matches the width. 7680 by about 5,118 vertical pixels. The rumors have been saying 45 megapixels, but I think that's just a rumor. Here's my bet. There's a 10% chance that they're using the best technique, which is oversampling. There's a 25% chance that they have an 8K width sensor, so they do not need to do any cropping. And there's a 65% chance that they're doing some amount of line skipping. Like I think they'd be skipping like every 12th line or so in order to read from the entire sensor. There's still some opportunities for Canon to disappoint us with this 8K video capability. They might restrict the codec so that it's only motion JPEG. I think in this clarification announcement, they would have mentioned it if it supported H.264, H.265. They conveniently left that out. So I'm going to bet that we are going to see the extremely inefficient motion JPEG codec, which produces massively large files without any benefit whatsoever. The Canon 1DX Mark II used motion JPEG for 4K video, and when we tested it, we found it to be unusably large for our workflow. If they were to scale this to 8K, it would mean that 64 gigabytes of storage would be consumed in two and a half minutes of filming, and you would need a 512 gig card to record for a full 20 minutes. So you can see, especially your long-term storage would be really burned up, but you could get a terabyte card, record everything to that, and then stick it in a computer and transcode it down to H.265, something a little bit more manageable for long-term storage. Another possible limit that they might enforce is limited recording time. They might limit you to say only four minutes of video or sometimes only even 20 or 30 seconds of video is common in, in cameras that record at high resolutions. The reason for this is that recording this much video puts so much pressure on the processor that it gets very hot and sustained recording could cause it to overheat. So you just gotta give it a little bit of rest. Another way to offset this would be to have an audible fan that's blowing air over it. That's what the Panasonic S1H does. And of course, our third option would be that which was taken by the Sony A6300 which is simply to regularly overheat and piss users off. I don't think Canon's gonna take that one, but I do think limited recording time is entirely possible. Another possible limitation of the 8K video is rolling shutter. It takes a while to read from the top line to the bottom line, and if something is moving, say, side to side, it will a straight object could end up leaning. This is a big deal in panning shots like a whip pan that you might see in video or recording sports which would definitely be things that people might want to do with this 8k video capability we will just have to test it because rolling shutter isn't something canon's likely to uh, tell us about before then another feature this camera has that's going to be brand new is image.canon capability here's how it works when you take a picture the camera can connect to your wireless access point send it across the internet to canon servers 
where they will store it briefly, generally, until you offload it to your own PC or Google Drive cloud storage. Canon's initial press releases had a confusing reference to 5G in some of the country's releases. They clarified here that this is a Wi-Fi only feature. They did not mention 5G, so that stings a little bit. But still, this is basically a first for this class of camera, allowing you to upload your pictures over Wi-Fi. If you're shooting a wedding, you can connect to the Wi-Fi at the reception hall and have an instant backup in case somebody, say, stole your camera. You could also get a wireless access point or set your phone up for tethering so that you could transfer image images over a cellular network. I believe Canon when they say the 8K30 is real without any severe limitations. This is a big deal. It puts Canon two generations ahead of Sony and Nikon because we would go from 4K to 6K and then to 8K. Look at the timeline Panasonic had for incrementing their video resolution. They started out at 1080 30 in 2010, they jumped to 4K 30 in 2014, and then it took them five years to finally get to 6K 30 with that asterisk there, which means they used kind of an unusable still capturing more data, but it wasn't exactly what people wanted. Canon, you can see, took a 10 years to go from 1080-30 to get to 4K-30, and then two years to get to 8K-30. How could this be? 2018, Chelsea and I released a video where we speculated that Canon was banking tech in order to make a huge leap on the competition. Canon had always been a technology leader, and even in 2018, it seemed really weird that Canon was so far behind. And we thought, what if Canon was just holding back? Here's a clip from that video. I think Canon might be banking all of their tech to come out with the most incredible full frame mirrorless camera this world has yet to see. If you were a smart CEO, you would find a way to really wow people with the new system. And one way to do that would be to build up a pent up demand by holding back tech and then releasing it all at once with a new platform so that it seemed like a great value to do this very expensive proposition for individual photographers to buy into a new system and potentially replace a lot of their lenses. I think they're banking on their tech to release what would be like a new 5D. Canon has the tech, but they're keeping it until it is reliable and refined enough to be able to release it. Can I paraphrase a quote from the Canon CEO? But he said the market innovators, those companies developing leading edge tech, pay a penalty for that cost. They pay extra to develop the tech. And if you follow a couple of years behind, guess what? You can develop the same tech much faster. I think he's saying, yeah, Sony developed all this tech and now we figured out how all of it works. We're making it work reliably and pretty soon, you're going to see a big camera out from Canon and he's going to have done it cheaply and more efficiently than Sony, the market innovator, could have possibly done it. It's weird, but Chelsea's crazy conspiracy seems to have been true. Canon has chosen to cannibalize their cinema cameras and they have overshadowed the headlining 1DX Mark III by releasing this EOS R5 with seemingly no limitations. Nikon and Panasonic with their mirrorless cameras, they have both chosen a video first direction. And that's because people pay more for video cameras. That's because while still photography is shrinking, the video market continues to grow. It made sense. Canon, by taking this on and out surpassing everybody, will really damage their existing market share and probably prevent most new customers from switching over there. It's not just the higher resolution. The reason I'm now surrounded by seven Canon EOS R cameras, this whole studio was built with Canon, is because Canon's dual pixel autofocus works better than any other system. It does an amazing job of pulling focus and everything else about the camera works too. Canon just works. And as a person who has released more than a thousand videos in the last decade, I really appreciate it when the camera just gets the job done. It's just a tool. And of all the tools I've tested, the Canon for video 
is the most reliable. I don't think it's going to crush Sony. Sony has taken a significant portion of the full frame market share, much bigger than Nikon or Panasonic have managed to make. And Sony will probably fire back with something pretty good pretty soon. Nikon's camera division is losing money. Panasonic has been cutting back on everything except for their core businesses. So I question whether either one of them will be willing to match Canon's investment. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. If you want an amazing website, head on over to squarespace.com slash Tony and set it up. It's totally free for 14 days, no credit card. You'll see just how amazingly easy it is to use and how it makes your pictures look just awesome. I have three of those websites. You should have at least one, but probably more than one. If you love it, use the coupon code Tony to get 10% off. In the comments down below, I'd love to hear what you think about the new EOS R5. What should the price be? I think it's going to be about six grand. I think Canon's invested a lot in this and they really need to make some cash. So I think they're probably going to gouge us for a little bit and then drop the price maybe a year after the release, especially since they're only going to be releasing it in limited numbers. Initially, I suspect why not charge an astronomical price? I'd also be curious to hear what you think of our new studio. We're still in the process of tweaking it. I think I might change this table and adjust the lights a little bit, but it seems like our workflow is down and we should be able to get back to producing videos on a more regular basis. That means, yes, our live show should be coming back soon. I know a lot of y'all are going to be stuck at home. We're stuck at home. Our kids' schools have closed. Uh, so we want to keep you company and there's not much else we can do other than stay home and make some videos. So look forward to a whole bunch of new tutorials that you can do at home. Be sure to subscribe to see those. Thanks. Bye.